At 8.15 on the morning of August the 6th, 1945, the first atomic bomb was dropped on Japan. The blast wave was felt as far away as 37 miles. Two-thirds of the city's buildings were destroyed. Although no official figure exists, it is estimated that between 80,000 to 140,000 people were killed instantly in the blast. The hundreds of fires, ignited by the thermal pulse, combined to produce a firestorm that incinerated everything within 4.4 miles of ground zero. Yet incredibly, less than a half mile away from ground zero, eight German Jesuit priests staggered out of their home, one of the few buildings still standing in that area, with only relatively minor injuries. Later, all eight of these men would be examined by US Army medical experts, along with the other survivors of the blast. According to these medical reports, the Jesuit priests suffered no signs of elevated radiation, or indeed any of the other ill effects experienced by the other survivors. Speaking on behalf of all eight men, 30-year-old Father Hubert Schiffer had only one explanation. We believe that we survived because we were living the message of Fatima. Between Zero Point and the main building of the novitiate of Jesuits four miles away was a hill which served to lessen the intensity of the blast. Yet despite this protection, all the windows were shattered and part of the wall blown in. The chapel, which is the left wing of the building, is built of timber with plaster walls. The glass in the doors of the main entrance foyer were shattered and the paneled ceiling was blown loose by the force of the explosion occurring four miles away. A group of Jesuits who were teaching in Hiroshima witnessed and survived the explosion. One of them has provided an eyewitness account. I am Father John Zenas. Uh, professor of Philosophy at the Catholic University of Tokyo. It is under management of the Jesuit Fathers. Uh, what were you doing in Hiroshima at the time of the explosion? Well, my philosophical class was evacuated from Tokyo to Hiroshima about five uh, months ago, and I was uh, staying with my class uh, at a house of studies at the outskirts of the city of Hiroshima. Uh, could you describe exactly what happened in the morning of August the 6th? I was in my room which uh, faces the valley, and suddenly I saw a light, like magnesium light, flashlight, which uh, filled the whole valley, and looking out of my window to find out the reason for this peculiar phenomena, I saw nothing besides this light, and turning uh, from the window to the door of my room, I heard a crash, it may, be, may have been 10 seconds uh, after seeing the light, the flashlight. And immediately I was covered with splinters of the window frames and glass sticking uh, into the walls and actually my flesh itself. After a while, we saw a procession of people coming from the outskirts of the city up the valley. Uh, Many of them, most of them, were wounded, especially the parts of the body which were not covered by uh, clothes, like hands, feet, uh, back. They came up to our house, and we did what we could, but uh, there were no uh, possibility to give uh, much of aid. Uh, what is your opinion as to the story that the ruins of the city amid a deadly rain? Well, I think that it's just a rumor. Because I myself and uh, uh, others of us have worked in the city itself immediately after the explosion for several hours and we felt no ill effect at all.
don't think it was an important part then, except that uh, since people were going to Japan and getting killed in this period, it was a great relief. And for several days after the news came out, I was convinced that uh, that this was actually a, f a hoax because Hiroshima was a port city. And so I assumed that in fact, somebody had equipped a barge with a few thousand tons of TNT, just as the cliche went, and they had slipped this barge into the harbor and then they flew a little airplane over and dropped something and set off this bomb. And so I assumed this was a great trick for fooling the Japanese into thinking we had an atomic bomb. But Nagasaki wasn't so accessible, so uh, I think many people must have wondered why, why did we drop two bombs? Why wasn't one enough? And my first thought was that <clears throat> it was to convince them that it wasn't a hoax. A few years later, then I met Oppenheimer for the first time when I was in graduate school at Princeton. And he was very hospitable and tragic. Twenty-one days after the New Mexico dress rehearsal, a lone B-29 was over Hiroshima carrying an atomic bomb. At 8.15 in the morning of August 6, Japanese time, the first atomic bomb hit an enemy target. The bomb was aimed to explode above zero point, a spot in the city at the junction of the Motoyisu and Ota rivers. The bomb was intentionally set to explode well above the zero point to dissipate its radioactivity. Here is the pictorial record of the result. At zero point, directly beneath the explosion. The soldier in the scene is pointing at the spot from which all damage to the surrounding area was measured in terms of distance from the center of the blast. Within a mile of zero point, the devastation speaks for itself. But in these very ruins, Army cameramen have found and filmed pictorial evidence that tells in twisted steel and stone the effect of death-dealing atomic power. Reinforced concrete buildings seem to have withstood the explosion fairly well, the damage varying with their distance from zero point. Within an area of a mile to a mile and a half, this type of building was the only type to withstand complete demolition and destruction. The destructive circle within a mile from zero point had a few notable exceptions, mainly reinforced concrete. On the edge of the area of greatest damage was a landmark, the Red Cross Hospital, which never ceased functioning, although it sustained damage. Today, it dominates the desert of a debris that was Hiroshima. Another notable exception to the general demolition was the Higaski Railroad Station in East Hiroshima, a mile and a half from the center of the blast. This building, however, suffered extensive damage. The twisted steel beams and concrete walls show the effects of the tremendous concussion. What's left of the commercial museum? Within two-tenths of a mile of zero point also gives indication of the tremendous push of the explosion. Amazingly enough, bridges did not suffer too badly at Hiroshima. This steel rail bridge, one mile from zero point, had the side toward the explosion virtually blasted by flying particles, which removed almost all the paint. But the side away from the explosion did not need a new paint job. Roads in the area fared better than buildings or bridges. Shortly after the fires died down, traffic was resumed. Today, these highways through the ruins are again in use. Beside our military traffic trudge the survivors of vanished Hiroshima, the first city in history to be atom-bombed into oblivion.
Do nuclear bombs exist? Your immediate answer is yes. But how do you know? During the mid 20th century, television and movie watchers were bombarded with imagery of what was purported to be atomic test footage. But what were they really watching? They couldn't rewind a videotape or rescan through a video on their computer. So what option did they have but to accept these images at their face value? Now we have opportunity to scrutinize these images to see if they hold up to analysis. Take a look at these trees. Now what was that? And who turned the camera? They're in awfully straight lines, aren't they? Now this must be a different blast because it's coming from a different direction. Wait, now they've put it back. But those are the same trees we saw in the first clip, aren't they? And now this. First they showed us these trees that they pan left on. Then they show us these trees that look like they should be next to a model train. Notice how straight the rows are. It looks artificial to me. Then they show us these trees again. Where's the forward camera? And then back to these trees again. And then they show us what looks to be a real forest that's been chopped down or torn down. Now take a look at this. It's footage of the first H-bomb test called Ivy Mike. Watch how it changes. That's a composite. Then it morphs into this. It looks like a completely separate explosion. Now take a look at the frame before the explosion and then the one after. These frames were cut together. Why? Then this frame was cut to this, which looks like the sun to me. It looks like they're zooming in on the sun. Maybe a composite because the clouds aren't moving. Then they introduced some sort of liquid. It looks like a laboratory concoction in composite with the sun. Next is Operation Dominic Fireballs in the Yukon. What does that look like to you? Watch it again. It's the sun. Now here's Operation Greenhouse. These guys are getting all ready to see what looks to be the sun again. The sun seems to start to expand. Maybe it's being zoomed in on. They worship the sun after all, Lucifer. So why wouldn't they use him as their greatest weapon? And who headed up the whole program? None other than J. Robert Oppenheimer of the Oppenheimer family, who is reputed to have been the original financiers who got the Rothschilds started in Frankfurt, Germany in the 18th century. He should do his duty. And to impress him, takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death. The destroyer of worlds. You're thinking, what about Hiroshima? Is that Hiroshima? Is that Hiroshima? That looks like Hiroshima, but it looks like it's been carpet bombed. Check out this image of Rotterdam. Was that a nuclear bomb? Now compare it to this image of Hiroshima. Actually, this isn't Hiroshima. It's Tokyo after firebombing in 1945. If you accept that FDR might have had foreknowledge of the bombing at Pearl Harbor, maybe you might want to leave room for the possibility that his propaganda machine might have created the myth of atomic bombs. There is no question that the powers that be have ballistics with tremendous explosive capacity. But this shot, for example, could easily be high volume dynamite. And what are we looking at here?
Take a look at this house again. Whatever was strong enough to blow it to smithereens wasn't strong enough to even shake the camera. And look how high up the camera position is. Are we looking at another model? Now look at this bus and this car. Whatever's blowing them up is not moving the camera. And this building seems to blow up from the inside. Everything gets blown every which way except for the camera. Except look in this shot, it seems to tilt up a little bit. Now this is one of my favorites. Watch the two guys behind the glass. Who's filming them? Isn't he being exposed to all that rocket fuel? Anyways, I'm not trying to convince anyone of anything. If you're hell-bent on believing that they can blow up the world at the push of a button, then go ahead. But next time you hear a politician justifying the invasion of a country based on the fact that they supposedly have weapons of mass destruction, realize that they're not only lying about the other country supposedly possessing weapons of mass destruction, they also may be lying about the very existence of weapons of mass destruction. And why don't they call them nuclear bombs anymore? About radioactivity that makes people crazy. It's invisible. You can't see it. You can't feel it. You can't smell it. But it can get you anyway. In this sense, it is the boogeyman. Further, almost no one knows anything about radiation. And so quite understandably, people fill in those blanks of what you don't know can kill you by playing it safe and overestimating the hazard from the radiation. And this already distorted image of the hazards of radioactivity is fanned by the paranoid ramblings of crazies, and especially of the paranoia merchants trying to whip up this fear to make people really scared such that they can capitalize on that fear. Fluoride Shield, Survival Shield, and all the products at InfoWarsLife.com grew out of my quest to try to find the very best compounds from God's cornucopia to protect myself and my family. And from our research, I believe we are bringing you the best, highest quality products. And you have that commitment from Alex Jones and the entire InfoWars crew. Wow, a personal promise from Alex Jones based on the best research from both him and the entire InfoWars crew. And of course, the small print just reinforces how much confidence they have in their research claims. Right? <laughs> Actually, no. This statement has not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. And from our research, I believe we are bringing you the best, highest quality products. And you have that commitment from Alex Jones and the entire InfoWars crew. Meanwhile, let's take a look at the worst disaster in nuclear history, Chernobyl. As you can see from space, the radiation level is so high that there is no plant life for hundreds of miles around the reactor. Well, actually, no. Indeed, it turns out that the radiation levels recorded directly outside the plant where this disaster happened can be so low that they are comparable to those that you would get cruising on a commercial jet. And the last measurement I can personally vouch for as I measured it myself. And for many folks, their principal fear of nuclear power is that this is going to happen, even though this is absolutely impossible. More on that later. But the paranoia merchants still feast on people's insecurity about radiation. And this can lead to really quite, quite crazy folks getting quite large audiences. I average around 600 people on a stream. Oh, all of these people show up on my stream each night uh, is amazing. It truly is, and because they're not here to play games. They're not here for nonsense. And they will tell their audiences the most stupid things ever. California is a wasteland, period. How can it not be a wasteland when you had MOX fuel, the number three reactor, is two million times worse. That, that went straight up into the jet stream at 100 miles per hour. Well, actually, no, California is not a wasteland. Well, <laughs> not a radioactive wasteland anyway. 
but he's not done telling people things that are diametrically orthogonal to reality with that steely-eyed absolute certainty that can only come with years of marinating one's brain in paranoia juice. Saying iodine-131 only has a half-life of eight days is the craziest thing you can imagine coming out of somebody who's supposed to have an education, supposed to have some morals and ethics. Well, actually, in reality, there is kind of this scientific consensus on the half-life of iodine-131. And yeah, it does actually look like a pretty good eight days to me. But he's just getting warmed up. What you're about to witness is simply the most stupid statement ever made about radioactivity. I'm arming you with knowledge that's invaluable. I've researched this all extensively over many years now. In order to really wrap your mind around all of that, I think that Dixie Cup says it all. A Dixie Cup full of this yellow cake from that 40 mile pit. You put that in a restaurant, you'll kill everybody there within an hour for the next four billion years. Like I said earlier, just keep filling that restaurant up. If I had a cup of 238 here, I would die before I finish that sentence. I can put that cup of 238 in a restaurant, it'll kill everybody in the restaurant inside of an hour, even if they just walked in and left, they would die an hour later. And that would go on for 4.5 billion years times 10, because of the way it decays, right? Well, let's start with the bloody obvious stuff. What do you think this uranium ore comes from? You dig it out of the ground, where it's been for almost the entire history of the Earth. Indeed, it's a significant reason why the middle of the Earth is still so hot. So if you have a little speck of uh, uranium-238, you're supposed to dig up six inches of the topsoil, 900 feet around it, and put a fence around it with universal signs on it. So yeah, according to this guy, almost the entire of America should be classified as a radioactive wasteland. Admittedly, when the Earth formed some four and a half billion years ago, there was about twice as much radiation from uranium as there is now. But somehow life still managed to muddle through it. Well, anyway, scroll the clock forward about four and a half billion years. Man comes along and digs this radioactive shit out of the ground and finds something useful to do with it. Initially, it's refined as yellow cake. Uh, guess what color that is? It was initially produced in huge quantities when it was mined in an effort to get radium, which is basically radioactive stuff that glows in the dark. Stuff that makes this clock radioactive. I actually leave it there, and what you'll find is it'll bury the needle. Uh... However, there really weren't that many uses for this element, uranium. But curiously, while refining tons of this material that they dug out of the ground, they made the stunning observation that almost everyone who merely touched this yellow cake didn't die instantly. If I had a cup of 238 here, I would die before I finished that sentence. If they had, they might have been able to think of some military use for this instant yellow death powder in World War II. Further, I've actually got to confess. I've actually handled yellow cake, this is this uranium oxide, in exactly the fashion stated here. That is uranium nitrate. There you go. Very yellow. A Dixie cup full of this yellow cake from that 40 mile pit. You put that in a restaurant, you'll kill everybody there within an hour. If I had a cup of 238 here, uranium nitrate, I would die before I finished that sentence. I've been studying uranium 238 because of wars for almost eight years straight. I've been studying uranium 238 because of wars for almost eight years straight. Maybe this instant death has a bit of a delay on it because I've completed a little more than one sentence before dying. Indeed, it's now over 10 years since I handled this uranium oxide like this, and I'm still not instantly dead. See, it turns out that this yellow powder that didn't cause instant death was kind of colourful, and so they started using this chemical in glazes for plates and the such like. You see, while uranium is actually radioactive, it's a weak alpha emitter. 
Alphas have lousy penetrating power, which means you can handle things like this with gloves with essentially no ill effect. What I mean by uranium is a weak alpha emitter per nucleus is it doesn't give off much radiation that quickly, that it's got a half-life of about 5 billion years. That means in the entire history of the Earth, only about half of the original uranium that was here has decayed. And now just compare that to the same amount of, say, iodine-131, which would release about the same amount of radiation in eight days. Yeah, yeah, so it's just another another way to get us uh, scared into giving them more money. So we're giving them hundreds of billions of dollars in this space race that America and Russia were doing. And they also did the Cold War, so they scared us into this nuclear scare and then stole a bunch more money to build fake nuclear weapons. And so, yeah, the nuclear weapons don't exist as such. The tests that you've seen, the very early ones like you were talking about are clearly fake, just done on models. Some of the later tests were done using stacked dynamite. You just get a shitload of dynamite and blow it all up and it makes the mushroom cloud, does the whole thing. And what they do is they'd tell one team that, you know, they'd have a bunch of uh, people 20 miles away, say, army guys watching, doing the, the test. And then you've got over on an I one island, these people stacking dynamite, saying that we're doing this for comparative purposes, and uh, the real nuke's going to be over on that island. Meanwhile, they got another team over on that island stacking dynamite for comparative purposes, and the real nuke's going to be on the other island. <laughs> so they even have military men stacking dynamite that they know is being used for these supposed nuclear explosions. Um, but they believe that they've seen a real nuke, even though they tell them to cover your eyes and put your head in your laps as it happens. They don't see anything until the mm -hmm. smoke clears afterwards. But um, yeah, a lot of military men will swear you know, up and down that nukes must exist because they were there at some of those tests and it's just dynamite. They do a beneath water by stacking dynamite in submarines and you can do it up in the air as well. The uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki nukes, um, you can see that they're clearly two superimposed explosions, one on top of each other. There's two smoke plumes made, made to look like they're one. They actually used this technique several times. If you look at this nuke footage, there's, uh, if you go to my website, nuclear weapons do not exist, you'll see these uh, three documentaries that expose the thing completely. Um, and so not only do nuclear... So, so for instance, in uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, what happened is that they were firebombed. So the, the cities were leveled just like Tokyo was firebombed, and the damage is comparable but they claim that uh, it all happened from one blast. Um, but this is clearly not true because flowers and plants started growing within a month and they say nuclear radiation would exist for hundreds, thousands of years and would cause birth defects and everything. But nowadays Hiroshima is a bustling city, everyone's living there, everything's growing there, radiation's not a problem. Uh, there is some radiation after any explosion, so you would be able to go there with a Geiger counter and, and get some radiation, especially right afterwards, but it, it dies down uh, quite quickly. And uh, nu hmm. nuclear power, uh, one of the most prominent nuclear physicists in America, uh, he's dead now, Galen Windsor, he was involved in setting up most of the nuclear power plants in America. And he went uh, all over America for years giving this lecture uh, about how nuclear power is just the most expensive and effective way to boil water. And they're essentially steam plants, and that's, that's all it is. The, the nuclear component uh, that supposedly causes all this radioactive waste that needs to be, uh, ha you know, hazmat uh, dealt with, and they drill holes into bedrock and and put the nuclear waste deep, deep under the earth, and they've got all these regulate these crazy regulations. He says, when we were first working with uh, nuclear material, uranium, plutonium, we it held it in our hands, and if some of it. Uh, was got hot we'd throw it in the water and that was it no no problem he said i would i would bathe uh, i would swim in the pool there that we would uh throw the the radi radiated uh, metals into no problem people thought he was crazy he started drinking a glass of water from it every day no problems and then in his lecture he he started eating radio radioactive waste so you can see on youtube type in <laughs> galen windsor and he'll He'll take out a Geiger counter, show you some 
uh, radioactive material, he'll take it out of uh, a tube, and they'll say, "Ah, oh, I've just caused a an EPA. You know, if if the EPA was in here, we'd have to clear out this whole area for half a mile, and people would have to come in with hazmat suits, blah blah." And then he puts it back in the tube, and there's some leftover on his hand. And he, so then he he licks his hand, shows the the waste on his tongue, <laughs> swallows it, and says, "I've been doing this for years," and so. The the idea is just, just another, another fear, fear campaign, campaign. The, the, and that's why they get the military involved in all these nuclear power plants and the, and the the nuclear weapons. It's it's to siphon off money, keep us afraid, and keep us playing off one another. Everybody thinks that you know Russia and America are enemies, and that the Cold War is real and the space race is real, but it's all just you know they're all like uh, WWE. It's like Hulk Hogan and Macho Man. You know they're all paid by Vince McMahon. <laughs> they all go out to eat together. Uh, you know, if if you're high up in politics anywhere, for sure you're part of this brotherhood that controls everything. There's no independent man at the the head of any any state. And and if if he was, what's he doing? Chris here from Hoaxbusters Call. This piece of footage here is from the Atomic Filmmakers documentary. I'll put a link to it in the description. Let's just take a look at some of the footage that they used in this film. Let's take a look at this explosion here. I mean, does this look real to you? Let's freeze it here. It 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 is not that is not real. I mean, look at that. That's not real footage of an atomic bomb. That is Hollywood special effects. It's, you know, it's pretty good for its day, but, I mean, come on, look at this. What I really wanted to examine was this piece of footage here. And let's watch this. Okay, the bomb goes off. Let's give this a little bit of a closer look, shall we? Something just ain't right here. Okay, the bomb goes off. Now check out this area right here. That uh, white flash, that part of the explosion. Now let's keep an eye on that as I uh, run this in slow motion here. Now watch this. Watch how it stays static as the rest of the explosion encloses around it. That's not possible. Watch it again here in slow motion. And reverse it. Look at that little blast in the corner. Look at that. It, it doesn't change. This is some kind of layering special effect. Some double exposure effect. Yeah, just look at that. I mean, just just look at it. I mean, look at the... Also pay attention to the little puffy clouds. Right above this so-called mushroom cloud and how they're not even affected. You know, let's rewatch it again and take note of that too. Just watch Atomic Filmmakers. They admit that uh, this footage came out of Lookout Mountain, which uh, in employed uh, Hollywood producers and people in the industry to produce all this footage. They admit to it. I mean, they're going to tell you that they went out there and filmed it, but no, they, they created it. There's no doubt about it. Uh, you know, why else would you need Hollywood people? Just uh, give it some thought. Thanks for watching. Folks, stop running in the hall. Princess, stop. Slow down, sir. Slow down, sir. Stop running in the hall, sir. Anthony, get the class. You're never going to become a college student at that rate. Fucking science, bro. Lepo, check. Goggles, check. Nodules, check. Fucking science, bro. Hiya, lads. Welcome to science class. Wow, quit writing raps in your log sheet. No one's gonna sign your ass. Okay, let's get scientific. Fossil fuels come from years and years of bio decomposition. It's really just scientific. Why didn't all the fossils turn to oil? Some did, some didn't. Anyway. Didn't Rockefeller pay a scientist off the year Geneva Convention? Wait, what was that? You wanna come up here in front of class? What? You wanna teach? You really think you're smarter than me? No, sir. Sit down. Cause your homework on the atom bomb and the world war, how it affected us then and now. Well, I seen the footage and uh, I really just want some answers. How does someone film an atomic bomb and it doesn't destroy the camera? I mean, 
I was just Bro! Bro, I'm, I'm just saying, I mean, I just I don't but know What the fucking science, bro? Lapo, okay. check Goggles, check, check, check. Right. Nodules, check All right. fuck, 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 fucking science, bro Welcome to history We evolved from Neanderthals That is no mystery Well, why is there no monkey fossils? What, anywhere? are you kidding me? I'm just saying, I just Should've learned that way back in elementary Man, this nigga don't know what the fuck he's What? I have a diploma Do you have a diploma? Or oh, we're learning this all My wife is a lawyer We both have a daughter She's doing fine with the things that we yeah, taught her Yeah, I'm just using the scientific method Did we evolve from electronical boy or homo erectus? And all of the fossilized footprints in the fossil records Don't show a line of thrust That's not consistent with compression the fuck did he just say? Yeah, okay, smart ass. This is real knowledge. Save all the hippie shit for art class. It's really starting to bug me on this one. Gonna have to trust me on this one. I've done the studies on this one. Real little rusty on this one. I mean, why can't you just answer my question on the subject? Man, it's not in the fucking book. It's not up for discussion. Science. I fucking love science. I fucking love science. I love science. Black folk, check. Goggles, check. Nodules, check. Fuck, 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 fucking science, bro. Damn, must have been the hell of them stegosaurus. It's over century burning fossil fuel. Still ain't no shortages. I ain't saying I'm Neo, but I'm nothing short of a Morpheus. Fuck, thought this was a globe. I gotta check my coordinates. You could blame my disorderly conduct on my subordinates. If it ain't no Coriolis, who's to blame for New Orleans? Why the poorest people always get extorted by corporate giants? We don't boycott, we buy in, and I find it unfortunate, yeah. Me plus you plus her plus her, that's four Bring your worst and I'm gon' bring much more yeah. Leave your nerves, your skirt both at the door In case you didn't know, cuz Fuckin' science, bro Well, Earthshine is much brighter than Moonshine Earthshine is much brighter than Moonshine Fuckin' science, bro Lapo, Moonshine Goggles, Moonshine Nodules, Moonshine Fuckin' Moonshine How many fingers am I holding up? Come back and beat it if you bold enough No Bobby Ray don't give no ounce of fuck Your team is weak and beat your bouncer up I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, bitch. I'm pleased to have as our guest Mr. Galen Windsor from Richland, Washington. I first heard of Galen from a tape that somebody gave to me some months ago and I found his story to be absolutely fascinating. His story is uh, unique to say the least. Galen has been in 77 different cities in the last two years lecturing on the subject of nuclear energy. The majority of his life, the last 35 years, he spent processing plutonium from nuclear reactor sites. He has worked in the Manhattan Project facilities in Hanford, Washington, Oak Ridge National Laboratories and Nuclear Plant in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, General Electric's Midwest Fuel Recovery Plant in Morris, Illinois, General Electric's Fuel Fabrication Facility in San Jose, California, and Wilmington, North Carolina. And he's worked in every major reactor decommissioning project around this nation up to this present time. His major work in these projects has been the analytical process inventory control, which means that he was responsible for measuring and controlling the nuclear fuel inventory for these projects. Galen Windsor has few peers in the world in this area of expertise, and those few peers admittedly know and agree with the things that you'll be hearing on this tape. However, except for two or three of these experts, they've all chosen to remain silent for reasons which they only know, leaving this man then the burden of leading this lonely battle of exposing what we call 
the nuclear scare scam. He's without question one of the world's foremost authorities in nuclear radiation measurement. And he's recognized by members of the Atomic Energy Commissions of all the major nations of the free world. Mr. Galen Windsor. God bless you. Thank you, Ben. We've been considering today how best to approach this subject so that you would feel comfortable with where I am. And we thought it might be appropriate to start with how I got involved in this game. Now, in 1945, I was a Navy radioman out in the Pacific on a destroyer aimed for Japan. We had a one-way ticket. That's all you get, just one way. So. As we uh, were becoming proficient at our business of fighting war, the Manhattan Project caught up with us and did a job. Now, the weapon that was dropped on Hiroshima, Japan in August 6, 1945, was a U-235, fully enriched U-235 weapon, where the material was separated and purified in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. The one that was dropped August 9th on Nagasaki was a plutonium weapon made at Hanford. But to those of us out in the Pacific, it was quite interesting. It had a ticket on it that says, you get to go home. I was impressed. Now, I was stuck out on Guam after the hostilities quit and was running a radio broadcast that communicated with 4,500 ships west of Pearl Harbor. Quite a few to listen to every dot and dash that I made. So I, I was used to having people listen to me. They couldn't see me, but they could sure hear me. I had all of the good messages that were to come to them. Fleet movements to Red Cross messages. They came along one day and says, we'd like to have radiomen to go down to Anahuitoc for the atomic bomb tests. Not me. <laughs> no way. <laughs> I want to go home. So they went through and they took every third radio man to go to Anahuitoc. I didn't go. They let me come home. But I wanted to go home. I had a driving need within me that says, hey, that big firecracker, I want to know how it works. I want to know everything about how it works. So back to the ranch in Nevada where I grew up and stacked hay all summer, gained back the 40 pounds that I'd lost out there in the islands, into Brigham Young University in the fall of 46 in chemistry classes. And Dr. Joseph Nichols could make an old farm kid like me love chemistry. I hadn't had any chemistry in high school, but the way Joe Nichols taught it, I wanted to know. So chemistry it was, and some neat guys like Carl Eyring taught me physics. And long in 47, I ran across a cute blonde from Richland, Washington. Now this girl had been telephone operator for General Leslie Groves and Dr. Enrico Fermi, on the Manhattan Project. She got to put through the calls to Franklin Delano Roosevelt for these guys. So she talked personally to FDR. And she told me some of the stories like you've never heard. She says, oh, in those canyons, great things are done. This cowboy from Nevada couldn't even imagine what she was talking about. Well, in 1947, after we were married, See, I ran until she caught me. I wasn't going to get married anyway. I wanted to get my education. I had to get on with this thing. And so we went to Richland, Washington for the first time in September 1947. I saw that those buildings she was talking about were there. 
thousand feet long, eleven stories high, five of them below ground. Uh, tremendous things. And people all over. Camp Hanford in those days was a whole army camp just there to secure that place, to provide security. Thousands of soldiers. You move around out in the desert and up out of a foxhole and pop a soldier with a gun in his hand. There wasn't any horsing around. It was all business. Back to school. In 1950, I applied for a job up there before I'd graduated. And they were so, in such bad need of chemist, I had a job before I had my degree. And so the last year of my chemistry, mostly English, I did on a bus riding 25 miles to work in the morning and 25 miles back at night. And I did advanced grammar and business writing and all of those things on that bus. But in September 1950, I got into this thing called plutonium processing when we did it barehanded, without instruments, without coveralls. We had some of the most peculiar acid burns in some of the shirts. And I found one of those the other day. It's got acid burns all up the front of it. Plutonium on it, too. Amazing. That was normal operation in those days. We ran those facilities, and we ran them so well that by 1965, we had separated enough plutonium when it only existed in the parent uranium matrix to a half of a single weight percent, 0 0.005 weight fraction of plutonium maximum in that fuel. And we processed enough tons of uranium to recover enough plutonium by 1965 to meet the weapons needs of this country 10 times over for the foreseeable future. Now we're talking about a massive amount of work. Hands on, do it type thing. And there was a couple thousand of us, and we were just happy as could be, just working like mad, making those plants run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, in a community that ran on shift work, A, B, C, D shift. The whole community that way, a wartime community, people dedicated to doing a job, and we were doing it, and we did it well. No pretense. Oh, yes, there were out in the reactor began to sneak in people who wanted a radiation monitor behind every reactor operator. Why? We know how to make these things run. When we got a metal fuel element stuck and it fell down on the trampoline back of the reactor, we'd go in with our feet and kick it off into the pool, smoking, burning. If you didn't have an instrument, you didn't know it was too hot, so you just went in and kicked it. Finally, along came a rule maker that says, thou shalt not do that. You'll get burned. Oh, I didn't get burned when I did it last week. But you exceeded the limit. Well, where did this limit come from? Turns out that in 1934, the International Commission on Radiation Protection fabricated a limit for x-rays. It was no longer permissible to be burned by them, erythema, reddening of the skin. You now had to keep a limit called two-tenths of an hour per day. How much is that? Well, you've got to have one of these Beckman instruments to read it. And you have to keep time of exposure. You know, there are four requirements on this thing. The size of the source, the, therefore the strength of the source, the distance from the source, the time of exposure, and the intervening shielding to keep from getting burned. Oh, fine. We've been doing this thing for years now and we've never been burned, why have we got these rules? 
And they says, yours is not to ask questions. Yours is to do and die. Don't you ask questions. If you do, you might disappear. Those who broke the rules didn't appear the next day. Military rule? Oh, yes. Absolute. What was your appeal? And people you were working with one day, when they weren't there the next day, you didn't go inquire why. You were just grateful you still had your work to do, and you kept right on doing it. Now, this is in the United States of America. Well, in 1960, we found out that the uh, materials that we were working with, the thing that we called high-level waste, that if you waited three years, these million-gallon tanks that high-level waste went into boiled off 15,000 gallons of water a day. Fairly hot? Oh, yes. This material that if it ever broke a line would seal itself off in the ground within a foot, make its own glass. It wasn't going to go any place. We did that a time or two, accidentally, of course. And so we started packaging this cesium-137 in casts in railroad cars like that and shipping it to Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And they'd take it out and make it into a barium titanate and press it into a pellet. And those things were so hot that they actually glowed in the dark from the infrared heat. Now, thermal ionic conversions came along at this time. So you hooked these little heat sources up to thermionic converters, and you took electricity out this side. No moving parts. These things went into the SNAP program. And these uh, early SNAP power generators are what power the underwater transmitters for our nuclear navy. We've got a regular road map under the sea. All you've got to do is have an instrument that knows how to find it, and then you've got eyes on a submarine. You didn't know that, did you? The power from it came from this material that they now call waste. We processed that stuff and packaged it outside at Hanford. Well, we had rules that said 3R per year is your allowable exposure, that amount of gamma energy that will expose a film pack. But that was for the people that uh, didn't know. We weren't about to follow those rules. We just went ahead and did the job. They sent around an investigation slip that says your dosimeter was overexposed two weeks ago. What did you do? And they had a cute little form on it that says, accidentally exposed to light. And that was the one I always used to check. Because it's the same amount of light. You know, if you get gamma through the film pack, it's the same amount of light as you get when you click the lens on a camera. They wanted to limit us to that. And one day we looked up, and they had. They had limited us to that amount of exposure. Then the fun part of the game begins. You say, who limited us to that? Are they powerful? Yeah, they control the purse strings. They live by the golden rule. Them that's got the gold makes the rules. If you like your work, you keep the rules. If you don't keep the rules, you disappear. Sure enough, some of us disappeared. Some of my friends gone. Where'd they go? I don't know. Well, two years ago, I started traveling for American Opinion Speakers Bureau, and one of the documents that they had was Major Jordan's Diary, a story of shipping the technology and the materiel that was developed at Hanford in 1944 directly to Russia on U.S. Air Force planes out through Great Falls, Montana, Fairbanks, Alaska, under the auspices of one Harry Hopkins, and with the at least tacit approval of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Now what are you going to do? That thing that we had been doing and feeling so good about had been shared at no expense with Russia. 
you go back and you check the record and you find Russia did not develop their own nuclear atomic weapon until 1949, even when we supplied them the material and the knowledge. Four years after we touched them off at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We weren't happy with that. We were just happy doing our job. Well, in 1965, General Electric was ready to leave Hanford. I'd worked for General Electric for that 15 years. And they took me out to California, San Jose, and we had in mind to design and build this nuclear fuel reprocessing plant at Morris, Illinois. They told me they were going to build it at San Luis Obispo. That's how they got me away from Hanford. But that was just to get me away from Hanford. I got to design the sampling analytical system for this plant. The sample cell was the hydraulic heart of this place. I got to dictate where they put the columns, how high the columns were in relation to my sample cell. One man standing in front of a lead glass window could sample any liquid stream in that whole plant. It took crews of men at Hanford to do the same thing. I wasn't happy with that, so I built an efficient system. I got to design that. I got to build it. Conceptual design, detailed design, build it, operationally test it. And in 1973, they says, forget it, friends. You don't get to run it. We had 170 tons, metric tons, of spent fuel stored in the basin. And the then president of the United States, do you remember who it was? Jerry Ford says, uh-uh, friends, no way. You don't get to run it. That's when I started to kick over the traces. Up to that point of time, I thoroughly enjoyed my work. I had no limitations, practical limitations. I had all the money to spend. I was in charge of the design effort. I built it the way that I wanted to because it was technically correct. All I had to do was check with engineers and make sure that it was right. And all of a sudden, I was told, you must reduce your limits of exposure by a factor of 10. I says, huh, I won't do it. First thing you know, you got the word that says, oh, yes, you will. And I says, no way. Well, that's when the rebel, Galen Windsor, started to show up. And when I found out that by management conference I couldn't get to these guys, I figured out another way. Now, in this pool is, in this plant is a beautiful pool. It's got uh, a place to store spent fuel bundles till it won't stop. 660,000 gallons of water, demineralized, just as clear and pretty as it can be. Heated to 100 degrees Fahrenheit when the outside temperatures are a minus 20, wind chill factors down to a minus 60. And I found out that I could swim in that rascal. You turn off the lights at night, and it had a light blue Kerenkov effect. And this kid from Nevada that never could pass up a warm swimming hole used to go swimming in that pool. There wasn't anybody that had the nerve to swim with me, but since I was manager of safety and analytical service of this plant, it was mine to use. Oh, boy. I found out that I could do that. I showed some financial types one time that I could stir that pool with my bare hand and check out through the same radiation monitors they did without triggering it. GE didn't like it. I got a letter from him that says, thou shalt not tell financial types that you can swim in the pool, that you can stir it with your hand, because if they find that out, they will steal the inventory. They will know that the inventory can be stolen. Oh, is that a valuable inventory? The same material that's labeled high-level waste by our current government, our current Congress. Now, plutonium is an interesting chemical element. It is created in a nuclear reactor. The Manhattan Project built eight of these reactors at Hanford. The first one took 12 months from sagebrush to nuclear steam to build, and it had never been done in that size 
before. How could they do that? Why did they do it? To create this element called plutonium. Plutonium has been assessed as being the most hazardous material on Earth. Now, from the standpoint that you can make an atomic weapon out of it, yes, it is quite hazardous because a piece of it that big, two and a half kilograms, that's only five pounds, is the force that delivered 20,000 tons of TNT equivalent over Nagasaki. Indeed, it is hazardous. The one over Hiroshima that had fully enriched U-235 in it was five times as big. So plutonium is more dangerous than U-235, is it not? By a factor of five. It takes five times as much U-235 as it does plutonium. Therefore, it is the most hazardous thing. Enter the great pretenders. They said that five grams of plutonium, properly distributed over the face of the Earth, would kill everybody on Earth. Now, if you can only get one 20 kiloton weapon to go on 2,500 grams, how's five grams going to kill everybody on Earth? Early on, I had a fear that said, if there is this much fissile material, that that can undergo a chain reaction, we called it in the beginning, then if you set a match to it, all the fissile material in the world is just going to keep right on going. Totally unfounded fear. It turns out that when you're in this business of recovering plutonium, like we recovered so much of it at Hanford, we found out that if you have it, in a solution where it's less than 5% plutonium, it won't go critical any way that you kick it. And when you get it to 100% plutonium, you better be careful. Because if you put it in more than a 5-inch diameter cylinder, you're playing with fire. You can undergo what is known as an uncontrolled criticality, accidental criticality. The air turns blue. If the, press, if the cylinder is sealed, it will explode from steam pressure. And that steam pressure builds up in a millisecond, which is about that long. No, you don't horse with it. And then you find out that those eight-foot-thick shielding walls on those canyons were put there because they didn't know how much was a critical mass. He says, if we make a mistake, we don't want to die, so we will provide the shielding. And so the shielding thing started for no other reason than they didn't know what was a critical mass. Well, through the years, we got pretty good at telling what a critical mass was. And I have worked in a plant where I had half a critical mass in this hand, barehanded, dressed in street clothes, half in this hand, wearing a lab coat, and I'd put this half in a pocket on this side and this half in a pocket on this side and walk down the hall. If those two ever got together, there would be a blue flash. They never got together because I was in between them. And we do that every day. And each half had to meet definite dimension characteristics, and so we'd take them down and pass them one half at a time, and they'd measure it and say, yeah, that will pass, and then we'd pass them the other half, and that will pass too, but they were carefully put in separate bird cages so they couldn't get together accidentally. Well, those of us who worked with it enjoyed it. We knew what we were doing. We worked at it. When the President of the United States decided not to operate that fuel reprocessing plant, I started scrambling to find out what was going on. Many things had been done in the name of health and safety. Don't get burned. You've got to have safety record. You have to be safer than anybody else. We were already safer than anybody in the whole world. Well, you can't get afford to get burned with this. You've got to enforce the limits. You've got to keep it. And I says, hey, that's not what the ball game is at all. I'll bet you the ball game is something else. 
And in 1982, when the Congress passed the Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982, a guy by the name of Mo Udall, I don't know whether you people in Arizona have ever heard of him or not, authored that bill. It's called the High Level Waste Disposal Act of 1982. The material he called waste is the reusable uranium fuel that I had been working on for 32 years. Needless to say, Mo Udall and I do not agree on whether that material is waste or not. The name of the game then is who owns the plutonium and how much is it worth? The government says bury it 3,000 feet deep in basalt and we'll hold a contest among the states to see who gets to bury it. Oh, why do you want to bury it? Did you ask the owners? Who is the owner of the plutonium? May I submit that it's most likely the nuclear power ratepayer. He has paid for the mining, the fabrication of the parent uranium, power generation, and is being charged in advance for its burial. If you're paying for it, to whom does it belong? How much is it worth? In inflated dollars, a ton of reusable uranium fuel contains useful metal isotopes worth upwards of $10 million a ton. Mo Udall says it's high-level waste. The value of reusable uranium fuel scheduled for permanent disposal probably exceeds the national debt. Naturally occurring plutonium quantities, and you know plutonium does occur naturally, plutonium-244 is found at the residual activities of the several, eight at least, Oklo phenomenon reactors across the world. First one found at Gabon, Africa. Naturally occurring plutonium quantities have been enhanced by transmutation of uranium. That's the reason we built reactors in the first place. Our ability to detect and measure emissions from these elements is useful in inventory control. When fissile elements, fissile isotopes, are present at less than 5 weight percent, plutonium-239 equivalent, and the heavy metal oxide matrix is stored dry in air, it has no critical mass. Remember we talked about shielding was because they didn't know what a critical mass was? If it is light water reactor fuel, at less than 5% equivalent fissile content. You can handle it, you can do anything you want with it, you can stack it up, you can have a room full, you can have a handful. As long as you keep it dry, it will not sustain a chain reaction. What then is all this falderall about a little bit, five grams will kill everybody in the world? Uh-uh, they don't know what they're talking about. And when they say that, they're thumbing their nose at measurement experts like Galen Windsor. I am insulted when they say those things and get away with it because it has no bearing on the truth. It cannot be mishandled. It will not expose any person to an unshielded nuclear reaction. In other words, no controls are necessary except to prevent the pilferage of the inventory. Have you got that one? Let it register. Do you need governmental rules and regulations and instructions? 
No way. Then why do we have all of those rules? Inventory control practices capitalized on the fear of undereducated masses who work in the industry. I didn't say anything about ordinary people now. I'm talking about the people who have worked in the industry and those who cast stones from without. The Ralph Nader's, the Jane Fonda's. Now, it doesn't take you much thinking to find out that maybe the industry is the source of the problem. The industry is the one that made up the committees, that made the rules, that the Congress enforced. You ever thought of it that way? The strangest kind of feather bedding that's ever been dreamed up, it makes the railroad engineers look like pikers. The only amounts of fissile process materials that are of health concern to the handlers are those that can accidentally cause an unshielded nuclear chain reaction or that will cause erythema from the shortest wavelength, highest frequency, and therefore the most easily shielded ultraviolet light emissions of the electromagnetic spectrum. Big words. Let's see what they mean. The emissions from uranium, plutonium, cesium, all of those things are only important if you assemble an amount that if you get this amount and this amount together, it can go critical. You can get a blue flash and therefore get burned. And that's happened 34 times in the in business, and eight men have died as a result of that. Accidental criticality. Documented in Los Alamos document 3611, if you want to check the source. Or if you've got enough of it together that it's giving off ultraviolet light of this particular wavelength and frequency without any intervening shielding enough to burn you, sunburn you, erythema, reddening of the skin. If it's less than that, if the effect is less than that, then what is the problem? Excessive government regulation. That's what's the problem. Tritium, heavy, heavy water. Deuterium is hydrogen 2. Tritium is hydrogen 3. If you let an inventory get away from you, what's going to happen to it out in the biosphere? Nothing other than it will become diluted and join the naturally occurring inventory of tritium because tritium is created in the upper atmosphere by sunlight. We have a natural inventory of tritium. Then the only thing that happens when you release tritium, which is the trigger mechanism for bombs, it's the source of the push that makes it go, is that you lost a valuable inventory. Then what of these people that are pretending that a little bit of tritium is going to do you in? It is not so. What are those two points? Only if it is an economically recoverable concentration or if it has a natural reconcentration mechanism. You know, there isn't any one of the radioisotopes out there that has a meaningful level of reconcentration in any of the species, not even the oysters in the bays in Maryland below Calvert Cliffs? Hmm. Why then are we still playing this game that any amount of this material is of hazard? Reusable uranium fuel, which has been isotopically enhanced in power-producing reactors, is a valuable national resource, not a high-level waste. 
the utility operators recognize the future worth of this commodity. Mo Udall, in that Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982, imposed a tribute of a mill per kilowatt hour, a dollar per megawatt hour, on all electricity produced in a nuclear plant so that they can research and develop methods to throw it away. Why do the utilities willingly pay this amount to the Secretary of Energy? To limit their liability exposure. Who pays that amount anyway? The consumer of nuclear generated power. You have no choice, and therefore I call it a tribute. At the same time, they have provided their own storage basins at these reactors at ratepayers' expense to retain ownership control of the plutonium resource. So you consumer, you ratepayer, you taxpayer are paying for the storage of this fuel, and WNP2 at Hanford has storage that will take them through the turn of the century, and yet every day they are paying a tribute to the Secretary of Energy with the concurrence of the United States Congress and signed by the President of the United States in 1982, 83. Who was that? Ronald Reagan. They have provided those storage basin at ratepayer expense to retain ownership control of the plutonium resource. I started playing a game one day, seven years ago. I says, okay, Portland General Electric, you've got the Trojan reactor, you've got a storage basin problem, I'm going to make you an offer. I made them an offer that says, I will take all of your spent fuel, FOB your basin, if you will give it to me. In other words, I will take it off your hands at no expense to you. I will ship it, I will store it, I will do everything that needs to be done to that fuel. And you know what they told me? Can I quote them? Go to hell, Galen Windsor. We value it more valuable than platinum or gold. We're going to play the plutonium futures ourselves. Now, where did I learn that the name of the game is who owns the plutonium and how much is it worth? The first plutonium I saw was in a glass tube on the newsreel when I got back from the Pacific in 1946. And that that they had in a glass test tube, they said, was worth a half a million dollars. Certainly they had less than five grams of plutonium in that tube. That's pretty expensive stuff. And so for the show, they put a pot underneath it in case they dropped it. They said, we don't want to have to pick it up out of the rug. When we decided, when it was decided for us not to operate this plant, plutonium was guaranteed on buyback by the federal government at $43 a gram. That's quite a price drop, don't you think? When that price guarantee went away in October of 1971, the price of plutonium became $10 a gram. It steadily went down to where its present worth on the market is a minus $2 a gram per year. That's what it costs you to hold on to a plutonium inventory on a material that has been declared worthless by the utility owners and rubber stamped by the Congress of the United States, and they're spending billions of dollars digging hole in ordinary rock so that they can throw it away, dispose of it. Okay, what are you going to do with it? Reusable uranium fuel may be properly stored in air-cooled, dry storage in a cost-effective manner. Newchem in Germany offers this immediate and long-term option as a necessary and safe step prior to reprocessing. They're doing it in Europe. 
At least four recently located facilities are available in the United States where this concept can be used right now. Barnwell Nuclear Fuel Plant in South Carolina, Midwest Fuel Recovery Plant in Morris, Illinois, this one, Nuclear Fuel Services in upstate New York, and Redox Processing Plant at Hanford, Washington. These fully shielded, already radioactively contaminated storage areas have secure, limited access. All have been operated under processing conditions of 10 CFR 50, and the MFRP has a 10 CFR 70 storage license, the only licensed storage facility away from a reactor in the United States. It singly, all by itself, is capable of storing all of the reusable uranium fuel that needs to be moved away from power reactors for the remainder of this century. We had that storage designed in 1975. Had the approval of the design. Why then are you spending money over here in New Mexico on the waste isolation project? Why are you spending money at Hanford at the basalt waste isolation project? Why are you spending money at Beatty, Nevada for storage when I can already store it in this building that's already built? I just named you three others that can do the job all by themselves too, and I know where there's 14 more buildings that can do it. What are we going to do? Redox and other excess facilities at Hanford are capable of dry storing all commercial RAF until plutonium recycle, at least through 5% enrichment, is reestablished or until the 22nd century, whichever comes first. RUF can be cost-effectively stored in existing facilities. Where does Mo Udall came off then, saying that you cannot use this plant for its intended purpose unless it is owned by the United States government? He has said that. The waste isolation projects are politically mandated wasting of national energy and construction resources. Plutonium proliferation by diversion of stored reusable uranium fuel is of minor importance compared to global availability of fully enriched uranium by laser isotopic separation. Let me explain that last thing that I said. Jimmy Carter said you can't ship plutonium to India, but in the same paragraph said you may ship them fully enriched uranium. Oh, Jimmy Carter, that peanut brain, what did he just say? He says that when the Israelis took out the reactor in Iraq, they had fully enriched uranium from France, and he says those rascals, those Iraqis, are going to take that fully enriched uranium, put it in that reactor, irradiate it to plutonium and therefore have to recover the plutonium in a plant like this and we stop them when the fully enriched uranium makes a better weapon than the plutonium in the first place. Now when the President of the United States says things like that and when the press gives it credibility I get insulted and right after I get insulted I get angry. And I've been angry for quite a while now. And finally, one day, I said, my own personal security is not important. I think I'll go tell this tale. All I want is to tell my story. The commodity that I communicate is called truth. And so then I ask you a question, a very brief, pointed question. Who owns the plutonium, and how much is it worth? And then I'm going to attach on to that a question I want you to think about till we talk again. If you haven't been burned by this particular source of radiation, what is your problem? You obviously have one. Otherwise, 
you would join with me in telling the truth about this particular commodity. And so, yes, I'm recruiting helpers. What happened to the guys who taught me the business? Thousands of them. The hands-on business. Where are they? They're still there. Why don't they talk? Who are the they that say this is the way the business is going to be run, whether it makes sense or not? 